Welcome to Grace Life Church. I'm David Kinneberg, one of the teaching elders here at Grace Life. We want to thank you for joining us online and listening to our sermons online. Hope they are a blessing and encouragement to you. If you want more information, you can check out our website at glcanoka.org. Thanks and God bless. Well, today we are going to be looking in Revelation chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. And this passage takes us to the very throne room of heaven. Before we get started, let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the time we can spend around your word here. We thank you for the fellowship that binds us together in Christ based on what he has done for us and our belief in him. We thank you, Father, that you guarantee eternal life to anyone who, by faith, trusts your son's promise of the gift of eternal life by believing in him as Savior. We thank you, Father, that you have given us a a purpose for life that goes beyond this world in the here and now and for eternity as well. We thank you for your word. We pray that you might help us to understand through the ministry of your spirit to interpret and apply what we learn from here in Revelation 4. We thank you for the Apostle John who recorded this for us so that we could uh, know more about your plan for the future. Just uh, guide us now, Father, as we look into it. Help us to apply this message to our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, it's rather odd, and uh, I could add troubling, that one of the best-selling evangelical books of the past decade is a somewhat fanciful account of heaven spun from the imagination of a four-year-old boy. You know, peddling Fiction about the afterlife as nonfiction has become a big thing in the world of evangelical publishing. Heaven is for Real by Todd Burpo it tells the story of Burpo's son Colton, who says he visited heaven while he was anesthetized for an appendectomy at age four. Colton, now 13, says in heaven he got a halo and real wings, though they were too small for his liking. He also claims that he sat on Jesus' lap while the angels sang to him. He saw Mary standing beside uh, Jesus' throne, and he met the Holy Spirit, who, according to Colton, is kind of blue. More than seven million copies of this book published in 2010, are now in circulation. And a sizable catalog of spinoff products have resulted, among which include the 2014 movie version, which was produced by a very popular televangelist and prosperity preacher. Now that book is not to be confused with another book entitled The Boy Who Came Back from Heaven by Kevin Malarkey. Um, no pun intended, that is his last name. <laughs> It's another runaway bestseller. Malarkey's book is about his son Alex, who at age six was nearly killed and left permanently paralyzed in a devastating automobile accident. In the immediate aftermath and then during his rehabilitation, Alex said he made multiple trips to heaven and back. Well, the Malarkey's version of heaven is considerably darker and not as full of details as the Burpo's. Alex says, there is a hole in outer heaven, and that hole goes to hell. The devil evidently uses this portal freely because he's a major figure in Alex Malarkey's description of paradise. Alex says he has personally seen Satan many times, first at the accident scene and then later in heaven. Indeed, this is perhaps the most vivid part of Alex Malarkey's whole account. He says, the devil's mouth is funny looking, 
with only a few moldy teeth. And I've never noticed his, uh, any ears. His body has a human form with two bony arms and two bony legs. He has no flesh on his body, only some moldy stuff. His robes are torn and dirty. I don't know about the color of the skin or robes. It's all just too scary to concentrate on these things. Well, those books are part of a burgeoning genre, currently one of the hottest trends in publishing. Imaginative tales purporting to be eyewitness accounts of heaven and the afterlife, among which include one we've probably heard of as well, 90 Minutes in Heaven, A True Story of Death and Life by Don Piper. And this is not a totally new phenomenon. Various survivors of near-death experiences have been publishing mystical insights about the afterlife for at least two decades. Betty Eady's book, Embraced by the Light, was the number one on the New York Times bestseller list in 1994. And the success of that book unleashed an onslaught of similar tales, nearly all of them with strong New Age and occult overtones. So psychics and, and New Agers have been making hay with stories like this for at least two decades. What's different about the current crop of afterlife testimonies is that they are being eagerly sought and relentlessly cranked out by evangelical publishers. They're bought and devoured by millions who would describe themselves as born-again, Bible-believing Christians. And these books are coming out with such frequency that it's virtually impossible to re read and review them all. But that really shouldn't be necessary because no discerning Christian should be tempted to give such tales much credence no matter how popular they may become. One major obvious problem is that these books don't even agree with each other. They give contradictory descriptions of heaven and thus cannot possibly have any cumulative long-term effect other than sowing confusion and doubt. But the larger issue is one that none of us as Christians should miss. The whole premise behind every one of these books is contrary to everything Scripture teaches about heaven. In his book entitled The Glory of Heaven, author and pastor John MacArthur makes this statement, For anyone who truly believes the biblical record, it is impossible to resist the conclusion that these modern testimonies, with their relentless self-focus and the relatively scant attention they pay to the glory of God, are simply untrue. They are either figments of the human imagination, such as dreams, hallucinations, false memories, fantasies, and in the worst cases, desperate lies, or else they are products of demonic deception. We know this with absolute certainty because Scripture definitively says that people do not go to heaven and come back. Who has ascended to heaven and come down? As Proverbs 30 verse 4 says, Answer, no one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man, as John 3.13 states. All the accounts of heaven in Scripture are visions, not journeys taken by dead people. And even visions of heaven are very, very rare in Scripture. You can count them all on one hand. Only four authors in the Bible were blessed with visions of heaven and wrote about what they saw. The Old Testament prophets, Isaiah and Ezekiel, and the New Testament apostles, Paul and John. Two other biblical figures, Micaiah and Stephen, got glimpses of heaven, but what they saw is rarely mentioned, not described by Micaiah in 2 Chronicles 18, 18, and Stephen, the martyr for his faith in Acts 7:55, As John MacArthur points out, all of these were prophetic visions, not near-death experiences. Not one person raised from the dead in the Old or New Testaments ever recorded for us what he or she experienced in heaven. And that includes Lazarus, who spent four days in the grave. The Apostle Paul was caught up into heaven in an experience so vivid that 
He said he did not know whether he was there bodily or not, but he saw things that are unlawful to utter, so he gave no details. He covered the whole incident in just three verses, 2 Corinthians 12, 2 through 4, where he says, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body I do not know, or whether out of the body I do not know, God knows, such a one was caught up to the third heaven. And I know such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know, God knows, how he was caught up in the paradise and heard inexpressible words, which it is not lawful for a man to utter. All three biblical writers who saw heaven and described their visions give comparatively sparse details, but they agree perfectly. Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 6, Ezekiel in Ezekiel 1 and 10, and John in Revelation chapters 4 through 6. They do not agree with the Burpo, a malarkey version of heaven, both their emotions and the details they highlight are markedly different. The biblical authors were all fixated on the glory of God, which defines heaven and illuminates everything there. They were overwhelmed. They were humiliated, petrified, and put to silence by the sheer majesty of God's holiness. Notably missing from all the biblical accounts are the frivolous features in juvenile attractions that seem to dominate every account of heaven currently on the bestseller lists. The discernment skills of many Christians today are at an all-time low, and that's why books like these proliferate. Despite the high-profile, high-sales figures and high-dollar accounts Christian publishers can milk from such a trend as this, it doesn't bode well for the future of Christian publishing, or for the future of the evangelical movement, as we saw in our previous study in Revelation chapter 3, verses 14 through 22, dealing with the church at Laodicea. As we'll see today by the spoiler account, as we could say of it in Revelation chapter 4, heaven is a lot more glorious than any of these current booksellers suggest. Here in chapter 4 is a scene in heaven which can drastically affect our lives and our concept of God. A greater concept of God that's gained from a se section of scripture like this can help us, help us infinitely in getting our eyes off ourselves and putting our focus on a holy God. What's more, in this chapter, we see undeniable proof that the church will be in heaven during the future tribulation period, which really should be a great comfort to us. There are many wonderful and powerful passages in both Old and New Testaments which describe the Lord's rule. Several of these that you see on the screen. In the passage, one of those passages from uh, Daniel 7, 9 and 10, in fact, provides the backdrop for this section of Revelation. In that passage, the Ancient of Days that we sang about earlier this morning were taken to the throne room of heaven itself. In fact, the word throne is mentioned 45 times in the book of Revelation, 14 times in chapter 4 alone, while it only occurs 15 times in the rest of the New Testament. There are a few other things we need to notice by way of introduction to this passage. First, this is the second vision of John, as indicated by the phrase, after these things, as you notice in verse 1. This also begins a section of the book which comprises the things, which, the things which shall take place after this, which is a phrase in chapter 1, verse 19. Uh, you notice the correlation of after this and after these things. In, John, uh, in Revelation 1, 19 is the outline for the entire book. John is emphasizing this to show us the sequential order of the book. In the regional Greek, uh, after these things is metatauta, after is a preposition, meta, uh, in the Greek, which shows sequence and refers to that which follows. And tauta is Greek for these things, referring to the things of chapters 2 and 3. Specifically, according to chapter 1, verse 19, they occur after the things which are 
which is the present time, the church age in which you and I live. All that follows then is chronological in that these events follow the church age, or metatauta, after these things. After the things of chapters 2 and 3 then, or the church age. The second occurrence of metatauta, that is after these things, at the end of verse 1, when compared with chapter 1, verse 19, relates to God's chronology. Its use marks an important transition in the book of Revelation from the church age, described in chapters 2 and 3, to the third great division of the book, found in chapters 4 through 22, which is, of course, still to come. The scene, uh, the scene shifts from matters concerning the church age on earth, which is nowhere found, the word church is nowhere found, in chapters 4 to 19, to a dramatic scene of heaven. And this new worship scene in Revelation 4 and 5 focuses on the throne of God and forms the prologue to the future events of the tribulation period that unfold in chapters 6 through 19. It gives us, it gives us heaven's perspective of the terrible judgments that will be poured out on the earth. We cannot understand the nature of the tribulation judgments without this scene. In these two chapters, John was given heaven's perspective of earthly events as he walked through the door that we're told was open up to him in verse 1 of chapter 4. And in keeping with the Lord's promise to spare his church from the hour of testing, that is the great tribulation, in chapter 3, verse 10, which was written to the letter, letter to the church of Philadelphia, the church will be raptured before the tribulation period begins on earth, as detailed in chapters 6 through 19. Secondly, we see the door of heaven. We know of heaven from passages like 2 Corinthians 5.8, which says that for Christians to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. But the door of heaven has never been opened until John sees it open here in verse 1 of chapter 4. What's it all about? Again, in Revelation 1.19, or Revelation 19.11, I should say, in the future, it's open again. And Jesus leads all the saints to earth following the tribulation, which immediately begins after the door opens and John is called up in chapter 4, verse 1. The first opening here in verse 1 of chapter 4 is not a direct invitation for the church to enter heaven at the rapture, but it's simply an invitation for John to enter heaven in his vision. And yet, it may well be a representation of the rapture of the church, when all saints living will, then will be called up to heaven, just as John was in his vision. And supporting this, we see the third, we see third that uh, John was called by a voice like a trumpet, as we're told in verse 1. And that instantly makes us, if we're familiar with scriptures, think of passages like 1 Corinthians 15, 50 through 52, and, and 1 Thessalonians 4, 15 through 17 with their similar references to the trumpet call of God. And the very fact that John is in heaven while the tribulation is going on down here on earth is symbolic that the very least of what will take place at the time of the rapture, when the church of Jesus Christ will be called into heaven. And fourth, we see in verse 2, the first part of verse 2, that John, we're told, was in the Spirit again, as he was described also in uh, chapter 1, verse 10. And this doesn't mean that he was spirit-filled, although he may have been, but that's not what it's referring to, but rather there's a transference of John to another time, the eschatological, eschatological or end times day of the Lord, and another place. He was carried away in the spirit, which is a phrase directly used in uh, chapter 17, verse 3. John wrote as an eyewitness, as one who was there. He was under the Spirit's influence, akin to a, a waking dream. Apparently, John's physical senses were supernaturally suspended while God's Spirit gave him the visions described here in chapter 4. And as we look into this chapter, there are two major observations we can make, and many others within each of those. We begin by observing 
the wonder of the throne of God in heaven, indicated in verses 2 through 7. And this section of the test is arranged for us beautifully here on the basis of key prepositions. <laughs> to see this, we ask, first of all, who was on the throne? Okay, I was one ahead. Who was on the throne, verse 2? John says that the one seated there was, uh, looked like jasper and sardius stone. And the jasper gem that John saw was evidently a diamond, and it may refer to light and, and brilliance of God's character. The sardius, which is incidentally named for the town of Sardis, we read earlier about in chapter 3, where it was discovered was fiery red, and that might picture the judgment of God. It's uh, referred to as being read in chapter 6, verse 4. So what we have pictured here is the holiness and purity of God on his throne and his judgment and justice based on his holiness. And beyond that, the scripture passage in Exodus 28, particularly verses 17 through 21, reveals that the high priest's garment of the Old Testament contained 12 stones, the first of which was Sardius. And that represented Reuben, who, uh, name, whose name means behold a son. And the last of which was Jasper, which represented Benjamin, which, whose name means son of my right hand. So this may very well be a majestic picture of the Son of God, the first and the last, whose plan includes all the people of God. Secondly, who was around the throne? Which is uh, what verses 3 and 4 and 6 and 7 dealing with. Uh, we're told that three things are around the throne. First of all, a rainbow surrounded the throne, if you notice in verse 3. We can ask, why a rainbow? Well, that reminds us of Genesis chapter 9, where God made a covenant with Noah that he would not destroy the earth again by water. And the rainbow here was a symbol in heaven of God's faithfulness to keep his promises and covenants. We're told that this rainbow was of different shades of emerald green rather than multicolored. It was not in the shape of an ark as rainbows are seen here on earth, but in the form of a halo as it uh, completely encircled the throne. Usually, you know, a rainbow occurs after a storm, but here it occurs before the storm, so to speak, before the tribulation period, speaking to John of God's mercy and faithfulness. Again, this was reminiscent of God's faithful promise to and preservation of Noah through the global flood of his day, as recorded in Genesis 9. And it symbolized God's mercy that surrounds his rule. Twenty-four elders were also around the throne, indicated in verse 4. Now, the identity of the 24 elders has been much debated. And uh, I spent a lot of time, I didn't get much sleep, just figuring out how am I going to, what, what view am I going to take on this? Because the amount of different views on this are just amazing from respectable, noted Bible scholars. But who are they? Well, first of all, I think we can say that they're not tribulation saints. Since they have not yet been converted, and because, as we're told in chapter 7, particularly verses 13 and 14, shows one of the elders asking about the identity of the tribulation saints. Neither can they be angels, because of the mention of, in chapter 7, verse 11, there's a mention of the angels and elders. The references to the, the, reference to the 24 thrones they sit upon here in verse 4 indicates that they reign with Christ. Now, nowhere in Scripture do we read of angels sitting on thrones, nor are they pictured as reigning. And the Greek word presbyteros, which is translated elder, is never used in Scripture to refer to angels, but always to men, particularly older men. Elder would be an inappropriate term to describe angels because angels don't age. And they cannot represent Israel because Israel is still on earth during this time period, the tribulation, and it has not yet been redeemed. The fact is, what we are told is they're sitting on thrones, co-reigning with Christ, 
They're clothed in white garments representing salvation, and they're wearing gold crowns representing eternal life. So it's most likely that the 24 elders represent faithful believers who will one day rule with Christ forever in his eternal kingdom. The fact that they are elders indicating maturity and experience and that they sit on thrones and wear crowns recalls the promises of Revelation 2, 26 and 27, which says, The one who is victorious and keeps my work to the end, keeps my works to the end, I will give him authority over the nations, and he will shepherd them with an iron scepter. He will shatter them like pottery. And also the promise of Revelation 3, 21, to the overcomer, I will give him the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I also won the victory and sat down with my father on his throne. There's also four living creatures that were around the throne, indicated in verses 6 and 7. Who were they? Again, the Bible tells us. In Ezekiel 10, verse 20, we're told that they are cherubim, angels who are the worship leaders of heaven. Whatever they do, all the rest of the host of heaven, including the 24 elders, follow. And we see he, that the center of heaven is God himself, who receives the wor praise and worship of all around him. Thirdly, what came from the throne? What came from the throne? Well, in verse 5, we're told that flashes of lightning and rumbles of thunder came from the throne. And these are associated with God's judgment during the tribulation. Well, later in chapter 8, verse 5 of Revelation, we're told that the angel took the incense burner, filled it with fire from the altar, and hurled it to the earth. There were rumblings of thunder, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. So John saw a preview of divine wrath that will be poured out on the earth as described in chapter 6 through 19, which is the account of the future tribulation period on earth. Fourth, what was before the throne? Question of verses 5 and 6. Two things are before his throne. In verse 5, we see that there are seven fiery torches. And these refer to the seven spirits of God, the seven angels who stand beside God, referred to in, uh, also in chapters 5 and 8. They're taking God's revelation to the world. In verse 6, we see that there is a sea of glass before the throne. Uh, to understand this better, we could compare with uh, fifth, chapter 15, verse 2, and, and Exodus 24, 10. But what that indicates is that this is the pavement or standing place before God, which reflects his absolute moral purity and righteousness. And that brings us to the worship of those in heaven, indicated in verses 8 through 11. In the worship taking place in heaven, we see the continual response by the living creatures in verses 8 and 9. Notice what we're told there. The four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within, and they do not rest day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders, verse 10, fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him, who lives forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne. The continual response by the four living creatures, they never rest in their worship of God. And their statement of God's holiness, holy, 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 it, it may be compared to similar statements. It's familiar with, uh, for example, in Isaiah chapter 6. And Revelation chapters 11 and 15. But we also see the immediate reaction of the 24 elders in verses 9 through 11. As again, we're told that they, they fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever and cast their crowns before the Lord, saying, before the throne, saying, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. The first word again of verse 9, notice, says that whenever the living creatures 
begin to praise God, they know immediately what to do. They fall down and they worship him who alone deserves their worship because of his power and his purpose. You know, friends, this is the ultimate picture of our ultimate purpose. Our ultimate purpose as Christians is to worship and praise the Lord. He alone is worthy and he desires our devoted worship here and now. Well, as we bring us to a close, what are some application questions we could consider? First of all, consider how do the various descriptions of the throne room of God in Revelation 4 affect me personally? How do I think they should affect my life? Secondly, how or what does the script description in verse 5, flashes of lightning and rumblings of thunder came from the throne, reveal about the character of God? Does that reveal anything about the popular concept of him in our culture and some of the recent uh, books apart from the Bible? Thirdly, how would I evaluate my personal habits of worship in, verses eight, in light of verses 8 through 11? How might I improve my worship of him based on what I've observed in this message? And finally, have I taken lightly the nature of and character of, of God in my daily life? If so, how might I change that? Let's pray.